what does it mean to be an integral human? Like what exactly is? Well, you said this only an integral human being, one what was where the whole is capable of overcoming their own fragmentation and leaping from planetary crisis to planetary consciousness. This is our individual and collective task. So I think you really uh, summed it up in that, like, again, you have to kind of hold both, but it's not an, an, an either or an opposite. It's like you have to you know, push and pull when necessary. And it's never going to be this either or, and it's never going to be nothing. It's going to be like, and, and, and it's not like we're on this ticking time bomb, but in some areas, we, you know, you can say about the, the myth of the apocalypse and stuff like that, but like there, there, we have been, we're on a road, as you say, we're on a road. And, and at some point in time, some of those kind of tracks will then even start going away. So uh, I guess we could just tease out a little bit from the beginning of like what exactly the different structures are really quickly sure. and then get to the integrity and then like what is the, that difference so we talked about the um like archaic or the pre-perspectival so that's like the archaic and then like magic so it seems like mm -hmm. you know cave paintings uh i did an essay about you know our psychedelic renaissance because i mean there's cave paintings that i i was looking up in algeria in nine thousand years ago had you know uh little little heads with with um you know mushrooms on them so it was like they, they've literally put it into the art and stuff. So um, I guess that archaic and magic and then uh, uh, any other examples, I guess you can off the top of your head, because we don't have to spend too much time individually, but just kind of giving a flavor uh, of them. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to, to sum it up very quickly. <laughs> a little bit of a like a, a catalytic microdose of, of, of the whole history of consciousness, right? Um, right, right, right. But yeah, yeah, the, the caves, I mean, really Gepser sees these structures as sort of unfolding and again you know he's, he's he's somewhat of a intellectual mystic so he calls it origin uh or originary consciousness but um the archaic is sort of complete identity with human beings and the world there's no distinction so i don't know what even that would look like historically mm -hmm. speaking um you know eden, we might eden or something you know like eden something, in, yeah. in a myth right yeah, but yeah, exactly, exactly in in biology and evolution i don't know maybe just uh early hominids or something along sure. those lines but even then you can make an argument that no they had some some distinction yeah. um but yes complete identification with the human being in the world um and then we move into the magic which is uh he says he uses the the the, the metaphor one dimension or one point uh, mm, yes, one yes, point yes. is interchangeable mm -hmm. with all other points. So everything's yep. a gateway to everything else. Everything's kind of entangled in everything else. Um, there's almost like an over-determinancy in terms of meaning. Um, animistic, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is mm -hmm. a kind of a group-oriented consciousness just in terms of uh, uh, um, a, an orientation towards the community, not only of the human beings and the, uh, let's say a tribe or a community, but a community within the other non-human community, right? So there's a permeability. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction, but it's a, like a uh, Deleuze is becoming animal or something. You know, there is there is the shape shifting into the non-human and the non-human shape shifting into us. And you mentioned the cave paintings as good examples. Primarily those are paintings of, of non-human beings sure, yeah. like bison, mm -hmm. cave lions, mammoths, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, with the mythic, and I will mention as well with the magic too, acoustics, sure. auditory, um, mm. sound is a good example of this sort of, well, you, you can't, unless you're actually on a computer splitting sound files um, your embodied experience of sound is, is very enveloping. Let's say you're in a mm. theater, right? It's, it's, it's vibrating across your skin. You can't really parse it out like you can with the visual sense of the eye, or you can actually like focus on one thing and then another thing. Everything's kind of working on you. So there's a very yep. participatory element of the magic. The mythic is still the same, but it's got a polarity now. It's got um, moving in and moving out. So uh, there's a kind of inward direct uh, direction in terms of um, listening to the mysteries or, or, or paying attention to the awakening of the psyche. So mm. dreams and myth and archetypes and gods. Um, you would say even like the cave paintings are an example of that. And I'm sure they were. I mean, and so, um, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Going into the dark and, and making animal sounds and maybe playing music. So there's this like Hard recently they, have, and... they, they did this stuff about like uh with with how the fire specifically when they would go back and it was like how the fire moved it, it and yeah. how it was on the rock formations that it would kind of shift the perspective so it was almost like you were watching those non-humans like move 
So it was like mm. a movie kind of deal, like moving your, you know, a, a, like a pre-movie. So it's very interesting, like, yeah, what they were used for and and whatever, it doesn't really matter. But those were the unperspective. It was like archaic, magic, and mythic. We're kind of moving through this uh, a, 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 this zone towards more perspective, I guess. And then I guess now you get to the perspective is where you take all of that and then it moves into kind of the mind uh, and, and perspective. And, and one little anecdote is when I was in Amsterdam, uh, I went to the Reich Museum and uh mm-hmm. and you know went and saw Venko's self-portrait and Rembrandt you know and stuff night watch but um what I saw what one of the most the craziest paintings that I saw and you mentioned this earlier with the art history stuff is is there is a bunch of merchants there's like four merchants and then basically the picture is them looking at you like the observer so you're looking at the painting and then they said that this was like one of the most er early uses of perspective like that literally they were taking the person who was going to look at this painting into consideration and then drawing for them which was before like completely against that people would draw nature and like monarchs and crap you know and it wouldn't be like that but then now it was like like these people were like oh hello you know what i mean like you came yeah, you, came, yeah. you came in the door kind of deal and it's like oh who are you you know and they're all looking at you and that that is i think i don't know how much that is, but but when 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 i was reading through this it was like oh like that perspective ch- perspective will change from all that stuff now it's to me like in my mental so i guess let's parse that out just a little bit before we move to integral yeah 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 that's a great example and there's there's many uh very interesting, like Dutch painter examples from that period I, that I, are, I think, it was Dutch. I think it may have been a Dutch. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. That, that really were kind of interesting in painting everyday people. And, mm-hmm, and uh, mm-hmm. they, they, there's a lot of like looking right at you, yeah. um, which is like kind of uncanny, even for today, you know, I don't, I don't think all, all Renaissance paintings necessarily did that, but mm-hmm. these are really, yeah, strongly evidencing perspectival consciousness in terms of, but that's the mental structure. So Mm -hmm. Gebser's terminology might get confusing because we go from archaic magic mythic and then mental Mm. and the mental, it it really is its own kind of defining epoch. That's why he calls it the perspectival age, because he goes, you know, there's evidence of the mental consciousness in many early cultures and civilizations, just in terms of directive subject, object, oppositional uh, relationships. So a lot of uh, literature around ancient battlefields and kind of masculine oriented patriarchal mythologies kind of had that subject object set up for them. And there's also evidence of like perspective painting in in ancient Rome, particularly in Pompeii, there's a lot of interesting landscape paintings. And um, so it's really interesting how that was kind of coming online back then as well. But in even like Julian James, I know he's, he's kind of seen as a weird countercultural figure and has a weird theory about the bicameral mind and, and how t- two halves of the brain weren't speaking with one another. I don't know about all that, but mm-hmm. I do like how he uh, popularized. And it's very interesting how the use of I in language really kind of comes online much later. Um, I forget exactly when he says it, it does, but um, uh, the, the medieval bards were, were beginning to use that. Um, in, in Odysseus, if you go back to Greece, he, he doesn't say I am Odysseus. He says, am Odysseus. So there's a kind of budding self consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's really Mm -hmm. what the mental is about with the perspective of world. That is exactly what you're talking about with really kind of, okay, let's kind of, it's almost like all of that stuff in the past gods and enchantment and everything. Maybe it's, there's some other world, but we're really oriented towards the spatial and the secular and waking consciousness, not Mm -hmm. dreaming, not myth, not magic, but waking consciousness. So there's a kind of existentialism that gets set up with that too. And yeah, that's really what the perspectival age is about. It's like when that really takes hold is the centerpiece for at least uh, European cultures. And now, Mm. you know, with our economics and our technology with globalization. Um, So that's the mental and yep. we already talked about the crisis of the mental is yep. that subject optic relationship gets a little too emphasized. We are kind of severing ourselves from that magical participation, that mythical image making that James Hillman does such a good job articulating and talking about in terms of, you know, um, this is wonderful uh, image he has in, in revisioning psychology, talking about, well, we don't 
put shrines around cities anymore. And so where do the gods go? They're, they're, they're roaming the streets. They're kind of haunting us. They show up as pathologies. You know, they show up as, as uh, mental ailments. They show up as mm. a kind of spiritual sickness. Yes. Um, without that kind of myth-making, you know, where do these energies go? You know, so, so yep. that's sort of the question. That's the, that's the crisis really of the mental structure in the perspectival age where we've disconnected ourselves from these earlier structures. Uh, but those things are still a part of us. So they show up in unhealthy ways. And um, with the integral structure, so, so, so much of the mental is about spatialization, uh, the, the development of the ego and individuality mm -hmm. and separate self sense. Again, mm -hmm. that Cartesianism eventually in the perspectival age. Um, with the integral, a lot of this, it almost looks like a Gepser uses the language of transparency mm. or a diaphony, mm -hmm. right? It's not that the ego or perspective taking or the secular world somehow gets undone or we reverse and go back to a better period or something like that. It, the ego becomes transparent to these other structures, these other modes of being. Uh, spatialization is still here, but it's much more constructive and con contextual, kind of like what we see with Latour's work on... Um, and how, you know, science, he's critiqued as the post-truth philosopher, right? Oh, okay. yes, but really, yes, yes, like, yes. Uh -huh. it's the idea that, well, actually, knowledge is sort of a, a cooperation with the non-human world and the bacteria that are in our laboratories, et cetera. So it's a kind of opening back up into the non-human and getting out of this sort of myopic, perspectival, anthropocentric gaze yep. that we've really been way too fixated on for centuries now mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. really that's the integral turn but the 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 main theme as i mentioned earlier is temporix for gepser it's um time is this wonderful theme for gepser and for for berkson as well and really kind of beginning to open back up to we were talking about hyper objects different multi-dimensional processes that can't be perspectively pinned down in a category mm. but you know it's not in the taxonomy it's in the relationality between different organisms and uh, we're learning about that in you know, contemporary science anyway, um, with like Lynn Margulis, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so there's, there's this opening back up to relationality, um, lifting as it were, uh, these, these, as I mentioned in that uh, point B, um, mm -hmm. the subject object relationship gets kind of diaphanous and transparent again. Um, right, and right. really that's where time comes in because it's like, you can't really understand things without understanding them as context, as process, as interrelationship. And that requires movement and aliveness. And that's not something that really kind of fits into easily or readily into a taxonomy or easily mm. or readily into, um, Again, a perspectival measurement. Yeah, right? categorization so the or a characterization in a, in a putting into a box of sorts. Yeah, yeah, the aliveness of the world is, is it comes back in the integral right. structure. And right. I would say right. one right. other thing when it comes to the climate crisis, temporix is so important for us because you know we are enveloped in time. Mm -hmm. past, present, and future are now collapsing into the singularity of the moment, just in terms of like what Andreas Malm talks about in his books. Like we are getting sucked back into time because we're burning fossil fuels that are millions of years old. Um, our immediate ancestors who worked in these factories and the oil barons that the drug, you know, created these companies, mm -hmm. they're as much in the present as ever in the kind of weirding of the climate that we're experiencing them. Very the momentum point. of the past few hundred years and our ancestors is present. Mm -hmm. And then what we're doing now is entangled in our future generations. Absolutely. So there's this extended sense of self as a temporal being in interrelationship with other beings. And mm -hmm. I would say that kind of sums up very quickly, very readily, that sums up the a perspective and the integral. It has to do with time, the relaxing of that subject object distinction and the importance of, of transparency, really being open to the whole history of our consciousness, right? Um, mm -hmm. Becoming, becoming uh, Latour talks about it as becoming non-modern, right? Or, or we are non-modern in that sense that there, we are these other things too. Um, and that's the weirdness of this, that I, or perhaps the promise of the crisis mm. that we're in right now, that we are more than just modern, right? And, and that openness to what that actually means and how that's integral to our survival, I think, is what we're still trying to figure out at this time.